It's all about wildfowl in tonight's show. I'm out on the Kent Estuary in Westmoreland where a duck is making a splash. Me and my missus, we both live off game. So that can be from like pheasant meatballs to goose meatballs to burgers, lasagna. News editor Ben O'Rourke goes to Orkney to find out how grey lags have become an agricultural menace and what the RSPB is doing to solve the problem. Answer, nothing. As we reach the end of the clay shooting season, James Marchington is at the British Open, which had a popular winner this year. We're giving away a trail cam worth 100 quid. We have news, we have hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. That is a sound to stir your heart. Goose song is a better lure for wildfowlers than calls are for wildfowl. As the geese make their way onto the sands of the Kent estuary in the old county of Westmoreland, wildfowler Ryan Teasdale is getting his kit ready. I just love being out here, it's so relaxing, it's my um, kind of uh, place to get forget about work and everything else, you get out here and, and yeah, everything, you do, nothing matters. It's it's brilliant so um but yeah the main main thing is that yeah like i say i, I get a source of meat from it so that's the way i do it ryan is joined by tom stevens and tom's daughter lucy they cross a salt marsh to get to the banks of the kent where they will wait and they hope shoot until dark lucy and her dad bring their 15 month old chesapeake bay retriever um they're good in water they're very strong quite stubborn as well i'd say aren't you? You're supposed to be on the Xbox, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, I suppose I should be really, but my family, most of them do go shooting or fishing. It gives you things about safety and nature and wildlife. And it, it does give you a lot of life skills and it's useful as well. The Westmoreland Wildfowlers Association offers its 100 members a lot. Lucy's uncle, Neil Stevens, is secretary. He explains how much ground they have. We have a, an access point which is just over there, which is Ulfa, and that there is an access walking all the way along that line there, underneath the viaduct, and we're going right back out to Grange. Here, pretty much as the eye can see, following at Milnthorpe, it's following there. So it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of acres that we have access to. People have shot and trapped duck on the River Kent for hundreds of years. The club began in 1950. In the 1950s there was a group of gentlemen who were very um, passionate about wildfowling, um, John Ruxton being one of them, um, based here in uh, Milnthorpe, close to the Kent Estuary. We were very, very fortunate to have a really good relationship with um, the Tyrone Wilson families from Dunham Towers and Dunham Tower Estate. Originally, they were ducks released just in the park, in the parkland close to here at Dunham Towers, and then more and more um, it's been uh, introduced into the, into the estuary for um, breeding programmes for, for ducks and, and for geese as well. It's not just wildfowling. The association has duck ponds, fishing ponds and its own pheasant shoot, which we walk past on the way to the river. This is the uh, Westland Wildfowlers Pheasant Syndicate, um, which is just one of the syndicates we have in our, in our club. So, as well as we have duck ponds all the way, all the way around the estuary. Um, and we have a few more further inland but yeah this is just one of them and what one sort of what sort of days do you have here uh we have between 50 and 60 bird days so we're lucky enough to have susie who you've seen her husband keepers it so it's a nice little little setup and an enjoyable day you you are part of it for a few years and then you move off and then the next people that are on the waiting list they move on to it and so forth and so forth and it just keeps everyone keeping fresh and moving on to it which is over at heversham way so it's over back to the back of us there. As well as the enjoyment of its members, the club is keen to bring in Young Shots. You can find out more about Westmoreland Wildfowlers Association Young Shots on our website. On the way out to the river, Lucy's Chesapeake Bay pegs a young pinkfoot. It's got no, got no meat on its breastbone, so I'd say it's either two, two, um, it's only a young one, isn't it? With hardly developed wing feathers, it's a wonder it made it from breeding grounds in the north and may be a victim of this year's late breeding season. 
It might not make a meal for the wildfires, but that's one sick goose taken out of circulation. We get to the river, tuck our heads below the bank, and as the sun sinks behind the fells, the birds start to move. Keep down. Lucy has a chance at one. She misses, and Ryan misses too. Another pair of mallard go over, and it's the same story. Then another goes over, and Ryan makes sure. Over, Lucy. With the Chesapeake Bay too young to start work, Lucy's spaniel is straight into the water to retrieve it. No, good at, good at, just. When it comes to shooting, wildfowlers often have to be contortionists. The sandy banks of the River Kent are comfortable compared to many marshes, but still require you to shoot from a sitting position. In wildfowling, you can find yourself in some awful positions, but yeah, as long as you have a good... Oh, when you're sitting down, as long as you're comfy, you can mount. It's just the hard sometimes when you're swinging around, that's the... But as you can see, I've got a good... Uh, it's just if anything was coming, from that that direction you'd have to wait for it to come over or you'd have to shuffle um but yeah you can find yourself sometimes when you're moving you've been sat in a, a long position you're in some cramps so you don't even shoot you're in that much pain but no yeah as long as you're safe and and that you're not unstable you can normally get a shot away working out distances as it gets dark is not easy ryan is fooled into thinking that this is a duck What's amazing is that you don't have to be a member to shoot here. You can have all this as a guest for the cost of a guide. You will need to show them your insurance and your shotgun certificate. The shooting is free and a guide costs £15 for the day. Neil explains. That just goes back into the club. It's not as a money-making scheme. It's purely so we can put uh, for new signs or for our Young Shot programmes for, for, for purchasing ducks. We do try to run such... a a high amount of conservation. So for every duck that is taken off the marsh, we try to at least put one down on top of that. You can do the morning, a tide, and an evening flight with us. And if you're lucky enough that it's a moon flight, we'll even take you out on a moon flight. So for 15 pounds, it's a lot of fun, isn't it? <laughs> At the end of the evening, we are up one mallard, one thin pinkfoot, and no bats. I watched her actually mount a gun and she did everything perfect. So yeah, it's just that bit more experience, like she says, but. I've seen her shoot ducks before, but you can't always shoot them, can you? So, yeah, that's part of wildfowling. Me and my missus, we both live off game. So that can be from like pheasant meatballs, to goose meatballs, to burgers, lasagna. So yeah, that's the reason I shoot. And obviously the scenery out there, is, as you've seen, is brilliant. So that's the main reason I shoot anyway. And do you eat duck, Lucy? Yeah, when dad manages to shoot. <laughs> <laughs> she can't shoot, get that many then. <laughs> Yeah, on a rare occasion, yeah. <laughs> if you'd like to know more about the Westmoreland Wildfowlers Association and to go shooting with them, visit their excellent website westmorelandwildfowlersassociation.co.uk. Thanks to all who took part in that film, and it is worth saying that you don't have to travel all the way to Cumbria for great value wildfowling. Basque runs a wildfowling permit scheme which gives you access to wildfowling clubs all over the UK. Visit the Basque website for details of that. Later in the show, we look at where geese go wrong. In the meantime, it's just wrong. It's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. Thieves are targeting gun owners and police say a link with the gun trader leak cannot be ruled out. A Newton-on-Trent home was burgled on bank holiday Monday and guns taken. Police say thieves grabbed a shotgun, air rifle, ammo and jewellery. Another Field Sports Channel viewer reports receiving phone calls from men offering to buy his guns. Police took this seriously enough to deploy an armed response team to guard the man's house for four days. A new statement from Gun Trader says that using the stolen data to identify the potential locations of guns is a criminal offence and is unlikely to occur. Some National Trust members want to ban trail hunting on its land. 
supported by Chris Packham, they want members to vote on a ban at the National Trust's October AGM. Meanwhile, members are complaining that the National Trust neglects properties vital to the UK's heritage, despite a rise in donations since coronavirus lockdowns began. It's also fired numerous volunteers, who donated their time to educating visitors. It laid off 2,000 staff last year, while cash reserves rose to £400 million. According to The Times, critics want the Trust to preserve history for future generations, based on its founding principles and not short-lived blinkered wokeness. The anti-trail hunting vote is delayed from last year. There's a new deer stalking qualification. County Deer Stalking, a hunting guide in South East England, has launched the Proficient Deer Stalker Level 1, PDS1, in competition with the existing DSC1 and two of the UK's leading land-based awarding bodies, Lantra and UK Rural Skills, have awarded the PDS1 accreditation. More than 30,000 people have passed the DSC1. County Deer Stalking plans to roll out the PDS1 throughout the UK with a series of approved verifiers, making it an alternative to the DSC1. Animal rights extremists have hailed the halting of a shoot on a hill 70 years late. In its latest attempt to mislead the public, Wild Moors, led by Luke Steele, posted on social media that a former grouse moor near Bury, near Manchester, is being transformed into a giant carbon sponge to save the planet. As one Instagram user pointed out, Holcombe Moor has not seen shooting since the Second World War. The critic's post was deleted. Wild Moors also celebrated the Woodland Trust buying Snay's home, 500 acres of grazing in the Yorkshire Dales, which it plans to cover in trees. Birds of prey numbers in North Yorkshire are booming. That's the conclusion of data from the North York Moors, which shows that raptor populations on grouse moors increased for the third year in a row. According to a report by the Moorland Association, Spawnton Estate spotted 1,552 raptors in its annual count, twice as many as 2018. The most common species is buzzard, seen 726 times during the year. Spawnton's George Wynne Darley calls it another encouraging year, especially with sightings of a white-tailed eagle and a boost in barn owl numbers. Pet napping is to be a new criminal offence in England. Pet thefts, particularly dogs, spiked during lockdown, but pets are treated as ordinary property by the law. Now ministers want a new law to acknowledge emotional distress that pet theft can cause. The proposal is one of the recommendations made by a pet theft task force set up to deal with the grim trend. It says 2,000 dogs were reported stolen last year and they made up to 70% of pet abductions. Dog prices also tripled for certain breeds. A government-backed scheme has released a further 12 white-tailed eagles on the Isle of Wight. Previous releases by the scheme run by Forestry England and the Roy Dennis Wildlife Foundation have seen birds range as far as Scotland, as well as killing each other. The eagles are fitted with GPS tracking devices. Sea eagles are controversial birds, as they like to tuck into lambs, angering farmers. Kenya's ambassador to Namibia has been fired after he went hunting. Benjamin Langat lost his job for the anti-hunting Kenyan government after photos of him posing with a greater kudu appeared on social media. Unlike Kenya, where hunting is banned and animals survive thanks to the state-run Kenyan Wildlife Service, Namibia has a vibrant hunting industry that funds conservation. An Argentinian airline has banned hunting trophies. Aerolineas Argentinas says it will no longer carry animal parts related to hunting on domestic and international flights. The airline claims the move will protect wildlife. The airline thought up the ban after animal rights group Humane Society International put Argentina in the top 10 of trophy hunting countries. Italian politicians are blaming each other for boars invading Rome. The city's mayor is threatening legal action against a regional government for the soaring number of wild pigs straying into the city. The animals are trotting through the capital and feasting on rubbish. However, opposition politicians point out the city streets are again overflowing with trash after the mayor closed landfills to try to encourage people to recycle. It hasn't worked and the boars are the winners. At the same time, farmers are complaining about boars destroying their crops and held a protest outside Parliament in July. A social media user in the US is under fire after he posted a picture of a gator eating a drone. The video shows a drone hovering above the animal in the Everglades in Florida, 
Smoke pours from the reptile's mouth after it snatches and chews it. Onlookers can be heard panicking in the background. It's unclear what happened to the alligator. The video was posted on the Instagram account of Dev H. Langer, who describes herself as a travel adventurer and destination skydiver. The video has been slammed as wildlife harassment, although some, including Google's CEO, Sundar Pichai, appeared to find it amusing. And finally, city folk will soon be able to get a taste of field sports without venturing into the countryside. Clay's is a massive new bar concept opening in London's Moorgate that will have 12 pegs available to take part in a high-tech shooting simulation. Owners are touting the game's precision and realism that make it an engaging shooting experience. It might be the only bar in London where punters are guaranteed to pull. Clay's opens in November. You are now to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. I still prefer Meredith. Next up, more cutting and slashing techniques from Paul Childerley. This is the Randy Newberg. Obviously, he helped design this knife. It's quite a, uh, a lightweight knife. Nice touch to handle. Quite a stylish looking knife. A uh, funky way to, to close a blade. It locks out nicely, but it's got a nice double pin, which you just pull back, which releases the blade to close it. It's quite a thick blade knife. Personally, I've been using this for more of a all round knife, everything you could almost you know do everything with the with the deer right through to using it as everyday work knife. As you can see on the end there, I've been taking out staples from the, the range and prising them out because it's got a good strong blade, not gonna break the blade, got a strong handle right through the base of the knife. Um, it's got this serrated blade at the back here, which is I think it's designed for sinews and tendons and cutting those awkward bits that the knife blade will struggle with. So when it runs across those rated edge it will cut through them quite easily. Um, there's a lock for the back. Put that back down. Forgot the bipod before I use my binoculars, but another one, forget the sticks. So basically just go for waiting up or something. Got a nice dead tree. <laughs> In there. Oh yes. <laughs> Perfecto. I might have a little bit higher actually I have to readjust my bipod. A little bit higher, oh yes. Oh yes, perfect. Ooh, steady the rock. Okay, the multi-tool, fantastic bit of kit, but it has to cover so many different areas. Everything from screwdrivers, pliers, cutters. This one's even got some scissors. Um, so you have to accept that the blade probably is not as functional as a purpose-built knife, which is basically the blade is the uh, main object of this bit of kit. Yeah, I must admit, this, this is a bit of kit I have with me all the time. It's something, you know, you, you're walking along and you're having to repair a bit of wire or pull a staple out, you know, you've got the pliers to do that. Um, to fix something basic, you know, you wouldn't build a high seat with it or build a new pen with it, but, you know, you've got a screw that's loose, you know, you've got, you've got the, the screwdriver. Um, the pliers are just fantastic, you know, something in the tyre, something you're pushing in. Also, you know, getting something out of a small hole, it's, you know, they're, they're fantastic. Thanks, Paul. It has been a strange clay shooting season with early summer events postponed to late summer. We've just had the British Open and James Margington went along to see who the winner is. 20 year old Brodie Woolard is the top sporting clay shot in Britain. He beat all the big names in the sport in a dazzling display of shooting at the British Open Sporting Championship held at EJ Churchill's Swinton shooting ground in North Yorkshire at the weekend. The British Open is arguably the most prestigious UK title in the sporting calendar, 
and the one that everyone wants to win. More than 1,000 shooters have booked to shoot the qualifying course over the first four days. Top in qualifying was multiple world champion George Dickweed with an amazing 116 out of 120. I was pleased with our shot this morning. We got caught in a horrible rain shower for about two stands, but there's been no wind. It's overcast all day. There's no sun issues, there's no wind issues. The targets are, are virtually perfect and uh, I thought it was a very good round. Each day of qualifying, the top five shooters from each class, as well as the top three in each category, go through to the final shot on the Sunday morning over a brand new 75 bird course. The top names dropped targets here and there around the course, while Brody shot every stand straight, right through to the very last stand, where he dropped us three clays to lead the field with a fantastic 72 out of 75. That put Brody through into the afternoon super final against some of the biggest names in sporting clays. Brody went into the super final just one target ahead of Mark Windsor. That lead could have slipped away in an instant against a seasoned shot like Mark. But Brody fought off the nerves and kept smashing those targets, holding his lead through to the very end. It's hard to explain how I feel right now, but it's brilliant. The British Open, I've, I've shot it for years and I've never shot any good. I've always let myself down on the final day. Like I've shoot good in the qualifier and then let myself down on the final day. And today it's all just come together finally. I, I wasn't too bothered with how I'd shoot in the final because I was always happy winning juniors. That's all I wanted to win. But coming away with this is just a whole different picture. Another great result was Barney Eastman, who took the Colts champion title despite, or perhaps because of, his bib number. Oh, the 666, yeah. Um, Somehow it's worked in my favour and now that might be my number. <laughs> Your lucky number. Brody took the junior title as well, of course, while Georgia Moore won ladies and Amy Eastman was junior lady champion. For the full results, check out the CPSA website. That was the last of the major sporting events this season, but Clay Sports TV will be back in the spring, so make sure to follow us and look out for our reports next year. There's a link to James's full report in the description. Next, if you think clay birds caused shooters problems at the British Open, it's real birds that are the headache in Orkney. News editor Ben O'Rourke investigates. Orkney, a cluster of islands off the coast of northeast Scotland, is under invasion. A destructive species moves in, threatens wildlife, the ecosystem and livelihoods of locals. The invaders are out of control and the only solution is killing a large number of them. Geese are the problem, although for several years the same accusations have been levelled at stoats, which arrived mysteriously from the mainland around 2010. On Orkney, anti-stoat propaganda is everywhere, encouraging people to report sightings, paid for as part of multi-million pound grants to a local organisation. Thank you for calling the Orkney Native Wildlife Project. Due to the coronavirus restrictions, our office is currently closed. For urgent inquiries only, please email stoked sightings, all one word, at rspb.org.uk. The Orkney Native Wildlife Project, a partnership of the RSPB, Nature Scott and the Orkney Islands Council, is carrying out a plan to exterminate all stoats under the lead of Sarah Sankey, the RSPB's former Orkney Conservation Officer. When David and Charlie caught up with her at the 2019 Bird Fair in Rutland, she admitted she didn't know how many stoats are on Orkney, insisting it doesn't matter. It could be hundreds of thousands of things. Yeah, uh, when you're dealing with an eradication, quite often it's the range that's more important than the number of stoats. So we haven't actually looked at how many stoats there are, and we know we have a lot of stoats in Orkney, there's a lot of sightings. We actually want to remove every single animal, and, and there is going to be a huge amount of skill in actually making sure that you've got rid of every single animal. So we're going to have to do a lot of monitoring for stoats. Many years ago, when I was, uh, 2010, I had a conversation with some senior RSPB people about the fact that stoats had just turned up on Orkney. And I suggested then it would be a good idea to ask the SGA, the Scottish Gamekeepers Association, who's the 
who's the best gamekeeper out of a job at the moment, approach him or her and say, look, we'll give you a cottage on Orkney, we'll give you a vehicle, all the kit you could possibly want, and a great big bonus when you, when you catch the last stoat. The ONWP says it humanely euthanises the stoats. However, it admits the plan is based on speculation the animals might harm the island's ecology and there is no guarantee it will work. That's after RSPB, Nature Scott, the EU Life Fund and UK taxpayers pumped about £6 million into it. When I heard they were going to get a grant of £64,000 um, for the stoats on Orkney, I thought, well, that sounds very cheap. Then I found out that the £64,000 was to write the plan. Now, I don't know what you could do with £6 million for conservation, but they could have, they could have eradicated the stoats on Orkney for a few hundred thousand pounds 10 years ago. They're now going to get six, essentially £6 million, and they may or may not succeed. Unfortunately, the stoat eradication scheme was named slightly wrong because Nobody in Orkney feels that they're going to manage to eradicate the stoats. They tried to map out that it was going to wipe out all bird life as we know it. And as far as I can see, the biggest threat to bird life in Orkney at the moment is skewers, blackbacks and crow type birds. They are absolutely brutal. The scene is set for a potentially expensive and never ending war on stoats. The RSPB has already complained that Nature Scott was taking too long to cough up funds for the ONWP and farmers are refusing to allow some of the ONWP's 6,000 stoat traps on their land. Nothing in there. I've been on agri-environment schemes for nearly 25 years, so why on earth would I ever try and stop them helping the environment? But um, at the same time, it didn't look good when they got this money, a huge amount of money, and they spent it on four-wheel drive pickups and vans, brand new. I'm not going to pretend it's been easy. We did try. Uh, we did try all the land access agreement with over 100 landowners, but there has been some anger uh, over the lack of money put into managing the goose, uh, the growing grey lag uh, geese breeding on Orkney uh, in the summertime. And that has caused uh, some problems uh, because people see this money being put into the Stoke project, uh, but then uh, obviously the, the, the geese are causing some considerable agricultural damage. For the farmer, um, you know, we do understand that the Stoke is, is uh, having less issues. The problem is that stoats are not the problem. Geese are. It's a case of four legs good, two legs bad, with farmers quite happy the stoats get rid of their rats. Greyleg geese, on the other hand, have been building in numbers since the 1990s to their current plague levels. We should not have to lose hundreds, if not thousands of pounds due to a bird that should not really be here at the time of year it is here. For the migratory ones, they'll not be in until a couple of weeks yet. And so it's only residents that you're seeing at the moment. Paul reckons he's lost about £300 on this field from goose damage. So they sit here and then they just take turns and walking in there, you see there's the tracks that they've been going in through, you see? Down there, and down there. There's your goose droppings here, okay? They're not only um, messing up the barley field, they're also messing up the grazing field, okay? Because there's goose and calves coming into here shortly. It's, it's quite difficult because um, the, obviously the funding that we've got uh, is for conserving natural heritage and so it's for conserving the native wildlife and the goose issue is an agricultural issue so there is no evidence uh, that we have that, that geese there's no scientific evidence that geese are doing any damage to our natural biodiversity hence you know we've we've not been uh, leading on the so issue. So you don't think they're aggressive and they would possibly be territorial and affect they, things like ground nesting birds? They are territorial but obviously uh, within RSPB we uh, we actually monitor our key species every year and since the goose numbers have grown we haven't got any declines to explain uh, so it doesn't look like it's, a, it's affecting their numbers. I would think the RSP would be would admit to you that they are so territorial at the same time that they are moving species around the county that's they're frightening them away they don't they don't just frighten them they, they like there's lochs with small islands in them stuff like that water holes in the winter time, they eat every piece of cover that that small animals have in the spring. So that small animals have to move on. Red-throated divers have been chased 
chased off certain parts that they've been there the whole time. Some of the farmers' reflections were they felt that the geese because they're quite big bully birds themselves, were actually pushing out some of the other rarer birds. So, for example, one of them was saying they used to have um, red-throated divers nesting on the farm, and they were gone. Even ONWP admits the birds the stoats are supposed to be threatening may be disturbed by the eradication and could be negatively affected. There isn't a lot of ground predators in the way of foxes or badgers as such. The main predators for the, the, the birds here and nesting birds would be um, the corvids, such as ravens, hooded crows, your black-backed gulls, bonksies, or great skewers. Um, they'd be the biggest predator towards the birds. But not stoats? No, not the stoats. No, the stoats, stoats are uh, minimal. We featured Steve Rogers in a video in 2018 about the goose shooting holidays he organises in Orkney. I joined him on one of his summer evening rounds, moving geese from farmland, where it was clear RSPB reserves have become havens for them. The hills in front of you, um, there's a lot of geese nest, nest in there, which is why the, that second lot headed off that way, uh, back to the safety of the, the nursery area. And with it being RSPB ground, we can't do anything on it. We could do with the RSPB coming on board a lot more for the farmer's sake. You know, I mean, the geese are no more native than the stoats. It was also clear there's no shortage of ground nesting birds as we pass a number of fields with dozens of curlews and lapwings, seemingly oblivious to the stoat menace. As in the rest of the UK, these species choose Orkney's heather moors to nest. The resident geese have been doing the same since they started moving in about 30 years ago. We have hills to our back there behind yeah. us. So the nest, that's our SPB. The nest there in the springtime, and then they just come over the hills here in their droves down to the water. So they're nesting on RSPB land? Other nest, yes, generally, because the RSPB thought they were saving Orkney in the 80s when they came and bought up a lot of land. They were slightly naive in the fact that most of Orkney's land had been cultivated that wanted to be cultivated. Nobody wanted to cultivate that peat hills and stuff like that, but they thought they were saving the, saving the wildlife. No one no muir burning and stuff like that. It is getting a better and better habit attack for them. The water Paul refers to is on the edge of his property and feeds the lock that Scottish water uses to supply the islands with drinking water. As kids, we used to come down to the loch shore, paddle and play and work a work. But um, what's happened is the whole way around here, it is just like that, the whole way around. Have you seen down there? Feathers, there'll be body parts, the whole way around. And like I say that, so it's going into your drinking water. Okay? It's, 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 um, it's more than an agricultural problem. It's a North of Scotland water problem. Okay? Would, you, would you like to go paddling in that? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> There's a dead one there, right there. That's actually a seagull, I think. Yes, that's a seagull. That's... But you, you know what I mean? Let me look at it. There. Anything dead lying around in water is never going to be good, is it, um, for general health? Beth Wells has been studying links between geese, livestock and parasites such as Cryptosporidium parvum on Orkney for about four years. Besides testing the animals, she took samples of Paul's water. A lot of the geese faecal matter was sedimenting on the bottom of the reservoirs and then they get a lot of wind in Orkney, so the wind would whip this up and, and cause a real problem for the water providers in the provision of clean water. Now, they were coping with that um, pretty well, to be honest. So the, the finished water samples weren't contaminated, but the raw water samples were. And obviously for the water industry, it's much better if that doesn't happen in the first place. Scottish water, they take for here. So this is the, the tat on this crap with them, if you can let me know. The Orkney farmers who are really very high quality, so high quality beef farmers, were a bit bemused at how they couldn't control this parasite or control the disease. So we were looking at um, the levels of, of parvum in, in the geese and cattle, transferring that to the water, and then obviously affecting, there was a public health effect. And I think too, we were also helping the farmers because clearly they need to control these geese and the, the geese are protected. So getting some evidence of disease transmission was actually quite important from you know, the goose management point of view. 
I think the importance for the farmers is to know that they can't really put susceptible cattle out in these fields that are heavily, heavily grazed by geese. It's all about density. If you get a lot of anything, you'll get a lot of disease. I think I can't look backwards. All I can do is look forwards and say that we've got a new goose group. It's different to the adaptive management group that was happening uh, previously and funding has been committed already for the first year to reduce goose numbers. That was two years ago. The goose group and the funding have not yet emerged. Steve and other shooters on Orkney are still patrolling the islands daily, scaring away or shooting geese to protect this small corner of the UK food supply. As is becoming more and more often in the UK, shooters are doing the conservation work and the RSPB is claiming the cash. Twice a day, first light when they come in for morning feed um, and again evening. You can get to a farm and, and see nothing but you've got to check the farms just in case because uh, you guarantee the one day that you don't will be the ones that get hammered. More RSPB madness there. And Ben could not have made that piece without the support of the Field Sports Nation, the plucky band of now 2,000 supporters who fund our news and other programming, who get their own exclusive show, Field Sports Extra, every Tuesday night, where they have the chance to enter competitions to win great prizes, such as this one, a £100 Command Ops Elite Trail Cam from browningbranded.com. I had to buy some trail cams last year. I did some research and in my opinion, for my budget, Browning came out ahead of the rest. So I would call this a prize that's extra worth winning. If you want to join the Field Sports Nation, follow the link in the description below. Next up, from Scotland to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube, it is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. Here's a film we made for Basque about wildfowling, so of course it's absolutely marvellous. Basque's James Green spends the day with the Gloucestershire Wildfowling and Conservation Association at the start of their Wildlife Habitat Charitable Trust funded project next to the Severn Estuary. This film from 2018 popped up as a recommendation for me. It's wildfowling on the fens with a punt gun in 1945. So when I asked Susie from Westmoreland Wildfowlers what wildfowling was like in those days, the answer is this. I belong to the Indus River Hunters group on Facebook, which is mainly about wildfowling, and one of their members produced this good film about duck hunting in Pakistan. Back in the UK, Jaff Jefferson of the South Somerset Ferreters is pigeon shooting and bringing on his pup Poppy. It's her fifth time in the hide and she's learning fast. He sends me this. Same idea, different gun. Simon 6 PPC has his FAC Daystate Red Wolf out to shoot wood pigeons over stubble. Thanks to Chris Burton, who sends this in via Facebook, a chopper trip into New Zealand's Southern Alps in the middle of winter hunting red stags by Wild NZ Outdoors. Thanks also to Stephen Crow who sends me this from Aussie Bush Harvest which he calls an excellent quality video on hunting Australian game. This is one of a new series on field dressing and will be followed by skinning and butchery. And finally Christopher Overvik recommends these young Norwegian hunters and filmmakers called Jaeger Kameratin. Apologies for the pronunciation. They are after reindeer in this film. That's it for this week. I've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the eye symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film would like us to pop into the weekly top eight email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv well that's it for this week if you haven't done so please whiz over to our website fieldsportschannel.tv you can click like us there on facebook and on instagram you can follow us on twitter subscribe to us on youtube and of course you can pop your email address into our register page and we'll contact you about this show field sports britain it's out at 7 p.m uk time every wednesday and this has been field sports britain good hunting good shooting good fishing and goodbye <laughs>